to host this event tonight. Torture is a deadly and serious issue that our government has participated in and has even encouraged other countries to participate in as well. And people of faith across this nation and across the world must speak out to stop torture, to confess our participation in it, and to try to work for justice and healing for the victims of torture. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, which we're, our congregation is a part, is a member of the National Coalition, the National Religious Coalition Against Torture, as well as the Lutheran World Federation, our community of churches worldwide has taken stances against torture and for the support of victims of torture. And with us tonight is the Lutheran World Federation representative from Central America, El Salvador in particular, Pastor Norma Castillo, and I just wanted to point her out um, today, this evening, I thought she, oh, there you are, hi. Norma, if you would stand, please, and uh, just so. Thank you very much for being with us tonight, Roma. And now I'd like to lead us in a prayer. This prayer was written by Laura Markle Dump. Please join your hearts together. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Fabry, and I'm serving as the president of the board of directors of Torch, Torture Survivors, let's see, TAS, Torture Abolition Survivor Support Coalition. Um, and on behalf of TAS, and the National Religious Campaign Against Torture and Amnesty International, we'd like to welcome you this evening and thank you for coming. We'd also like to uh, acknowledge our co-sponsors, Advocates for Survivors of Torture and Trauma, Bill of Rights Defense Committee, Center for Constitutional Rights, the Center for Victims of Torture, Council on American Islamic Relations, Disciples Justice Action Network, Franciscan Action Network, Human Rights Ministries of the Christian Church, Interfaith Action for Human Rights, Marino Office for Global Concerns, the Presbyterian Church, the Refuge Media Project, Jeruha, the Rabbinic Call for Human Rights, UCC Justice and Witness Office, Witness Against Torture, and World Can't Wait. You can see we have a lot of support because this is an important topic and we're very happy you're here with us this evening. Good evening, I'm Linda Gostaitis, and I'm the president of the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. I want to also extend my thanks to you for coming out tonight. I'm always so grateful when people show up to talk about such a very, very tough topic as torture. So I am I'm very grateful for your presence. We have um, 80,000 people, it's estimated, in the United States who live in solitary confinement at this point in time. Probably 25 to 30,000 of those people are in long-term solitary confinement. It wasn't always that way. In the 1980s, we had one prison dedicated to solitary confinement. Now, with the explosion of supermax prisons, we have 45 prisons dedicated exclusively to the use of solitary confinement. America is a world leader, if not the world leader, in the use of solitary confinement. And it's our job to wake America up to this gross abuse of human rights. So tonight um, is today, this month, is Torture Awareness Month. We hope we never have to have it again. We hope torture leaves the face of the earth and that we would never have to honor the Torture Awareness Month again. But we do until we no longer have torture on this planet. Tomorrow, by the way, is the International Day commemorating the victims of torture. And we are hosting, a, uh, many groups are hosting a vigil down at the White House between noon and one. And I encourage you and welcome you to attend that vigil. It's now my pleasure to introduce Juan Mendez, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on torture and other cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. He happens to be a visiting professor at American University Law School, um, so we have the pleasure of having his presence in a number of our events here in Washington, D.C. Mr. Mendez is a native of Argentina, 
and he has dedicated his legal career to the defense of human rights and has a long and distinguished career of advocacy throughout the Americas. As a result of his involvement in representing political prisoners, the Argentinian military dictatorship arrested him and subjected him to torture and administrative detention for more than a year. During this time, Amnesty International adopted him as a prisoner of conscience. After being expelled from his country in 1977, Mr. Mendez moved to the United States. For 15 years, Mr. Mendez worked with Human Rights Watch, concentrating his efforts on human rights issues in the Western Hemisphere. And in 1994, he became Human Rights Watch's general counsel. More recently, Mr. Mendez has served as the executive director of the Inter-American Institute of Human Rights in Costa Rica, president of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights of the Organization of American States, president of the International Center for Transitional Justice, and UN Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide. It is a real honor to introduce and to offer to you tonight Mr. Mendez. Thank you very much. Uh, thank all of you for being here, but I especially want to thank and congratulate uh, TASC and uh, the National Religious Campaign Against Torture uh, for the idea of uh, uh, commemorating the International Day for Victims of Torture uh, and uh, commemorated by organizing a campaign to raise awareness about uh, the different forms of torture and truly human and degrading treatment that unfortunately go on all the time, even in our midst. <coughs> on this day um, of the International, International Day for the Victims of Torture, I want to uh, re reaffirm what uh, I said when I first uh, assumed the position of Special Rapporteur on Torture, and that is that my approach to the work of the rapporteurship is going to be victim-centered. I know amongst you I should use the word survivor-centered rather than victim-centered, and I'm pleased to do it because uh, I understand um, uh, the difference between uh, uh, calling uh, someone a survivor and calling him a victim or her a victim. Uh, but, but I'd like to reflect again on what it means to have a survivor-centered uh, approach to the mandate that the United Nations Human Rights Council has entrusted it with. First of all, uh, I, I, I've been trying to put uh, much more of an emphasis on the right to reparations um, that is uh, obviously a right that survivors of torture have, uh, but also uh, a solemn obligation that states have to offer reparations uh, to those who have been victimized by torture. Uh, it's not only a specific obligation in the Convention Against Torture, but it is also a customary international law norm that applies to states whether or not they have signed and ratified the Convention Against Torture. Uh, we have been insisting together with the Committee Against Torture and the uh, Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture that reparations should not only be monetary, but that they should include rehabilitation services. Um, Unfortunately, rehabilitation services are non-existent in most countries that we deal with uh, on a daily basis. And even where they do exist, they suffer from a very serious lack of financial support. Nevertheless, and on the bright side, over the years, uh, several professional centers have uh, come up in the United States and elsewhere uh, that have gained great experience and, and whose members show exemplary dedication and uh, can be an inspiration to us and to well-meaning governments uh, worldwide. Um, they not only uh, provide services, but they also help set, set, set standards. Uh, for example, it is owed uh, mostly to uh, 
healthcare professionals uh, who work uh, with uh, victims of torture, that we now have uh, uh, a soft law instrument called the Istanbul Protocol uh, that is supposed to be the, uh, the standard that all states should abide by in determining how to prove uh, that uh, torture has in fact uh, occurred. And I want to stress that this is a very important uh, part of, of, of the mandate uh, because one important obligation or couple of important obligations that the states uh, assume are first to investigate, prosecute, and punish every single act of torture. And second, to deprive any declaration or confession obtained under torture from any legal effect in proceedings against uh, the, the, the person forced to confess or to make a declaration, or even against anybody else. Unfortunately, both of those uh, you know, important standards uh, are uh, very easily uh, uh, ignored in practice because states uh, generally uh, take the position that first you have to prove that somebody has been tortured, which of course is a bad faith interpretation. I mean, it's up to uh, the state and the prosecutors to show that a confession has been obtained without violating uh, the, the prohibition of torture. But in practice, unfortunately, uh, it's very uh, common uh, that those two cardinal principles of the prohibition of torture are ignored by simply putting the burden on the victim to show that he or she has been tortured. So the protocol, the Istanbul Protocol, uh, serves an important purpose, and uh, it's important now to to say that we owe it to all the many uh, professionals who work uh, in services, uh, rehabilitation, and other kinds of reparation services to the victims. I also want to note that the United Nations has had for some years now uh, a voluntary fund for the victims of torture that does heroic work in assisting civil society organizations that themselves uh, provide uh, support services to victims and survivors of torture. Unfortunately, in the financial crisis, the contributions by states to this voluntary fund have really dwindled, and nowadays the UN fund uh, you know, is in a position to do much less than it used to do, and so it's important to call for a replenishment of its capacities to, to, to help. But on the question of re reparations, uh, I, uh, a, a, a survivor center approach insists also on the participation of and the consultation with the victims on the design and implementation of all reparations uh, and rehabilitation services and programs. First, we need to avoid a one-size-fits-all approach. You know, uh, every survivor of torture has a different problem, and uh, it's important to, uh, to serve each one of them uh, in his or her own terms and, uh, and, and in attention to his or her special needs. This also would allow us to recognize the multi-layered dimension of torture and the various effects that torture has on the person, but also on his or her family, and even on the community uh, uh, that, uh, that supports uh, that, that particular victim. It also allows us to have a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, the, the reparations and rehabilitation services uh, are obviously medical and psychiatric, uh, most of all, but they should also include social services and legal redress where appropriate uh, in order to uh, 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 recognize the multi-layered dimension of torture and its effects. Uh, essentially, I guess what I mean is that we, are, we have to stress that states have to work with survivors, not on survivors. I think the victim participation uh, is important also in accountability for torture. As I said, one of the major cardinal principles of the international law regarding torture is the obligation to investigate, prosecute, and punish every single act. And in this sense, torture is different from other violations of human rights 
because it doesn't even have to be a crime against humanity, that is, torture as part of a widespread or systematic practice. A single event of torture elicits the obligation of the state to investigate, prosecute, and punish the perpetrator. And in that sense, victim participation and accountability uh, is particularly important to a survivor-centered survivor uh, approach. Uh, <clears throat> The victim is not an object of, uh, uh, of proof uh, and is not merely a passive witness. The victim must also be able to initiate proceedings even where the law creates a sort of a prosecutorial monopoly on criminal investigations and on prosecutions. Where the state, where the law does not uh, provide for uh, independent initiation of uh, torture investigations by survivors, it should. And from the rapporteurship, we uh, demand that states do that. And besides, the, the participation should be active uh, and, and throughout the process, beginning even with the investigatory stages. And um, so, uh, it, it, it follows also that the participation of the survivor should be surrounded by guarantees of non reprisals. Does it, uh, uh, as we all know, it's very difficult, very complicated to break the cycle of silence and actually demand redress, and particularly redress that means prosecution of the perpetrators. But I think the, the, this, this um, survivor-centered approach also has led me, in the two or three years that I've been doing this work, to, 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 to try to insist on the uh, cases of torture and cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment that happen in settings that we don't normally associate, uh, or that the public eye doesn't normally associate with torture. Uh, fortunately, the international law standard is very clear, and uh, it is not limited to uh, torture for the purpose of interrogation. Uh, so torture can. Uh, can happen as uh, pain and, and, and suffering, even supposedly resulting from legally imposed uh, sanctions. And in, in that sense, uh, I have tried in, in thematic reports to uh, foster a discussion about when some of those legal, uh, regularly imposed uh, sanctions cross the line into cruel human and degrading treatment or cross the line even further into torture. And that's why I wrote a report on the death penalty, because it seems to me that the death row phenomenon is in itself cruelly human and degrading treatment and should be reason enough for the abolition of the death penalty altogether. Yes. 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 But also the methods of execution. By now, uh, uh, the human conscience has declare that some methods of execution are so beyond the pale that, uh, that they shouldn't be applied even in regularly imposed death penalty cases where the state has retained the death penalty. So uh, it seems to me like we should explore every method of execution because I think we will find that there is no such thing as a painless form of execution. And that therefore it doesn't make sense to retain the death penalty uh, because it's uh, legally imposed. Uh, when in fact we are still uh, using it in ways that uh, cross the line into uh, practices that, uh, that are supposed to be absolutely prohibited and absolutely prohibited under any and all circumstances. But I also think that in terms of uh, regularly uh, imposed penalties or sanctions, uh, that's why we also work on solitary confinement. Um, uh, I found uh, through my uh, work that solitary confinement is being used more and more uh, and more extensively and for different purposes in all the world. Fortunately, not in the numbers uh, uh, that unfortunately the United States uh, is uh, known for, uh, but I think the United States uh, experience with solitary confinement is spread and is spreading to other countries uh, that uh, are beginning to think that because it happens uh, in, you know, behind closed doors and because there's no physical proof uh, of, of, of damage, uh, then therefore 
you know, a pub, the, the, the perpetrators get away with uh, the notion that because it doesn't do those things, therefore it's not torture. But, but the prohibition on torture is very clear that it applies not only to physical suffering, uh, pain and suffering, but also to mental pain and suffering. So to the extent that uh, spending uh, 24 hours or even 22 or 23 hours looking at a wall uh, creates uh, a different way for the brain to operate um, and that that uh, can have lasting effects uh, seems to me to be reason enough to, uh, uh, to call into question whether solitary confinement can ever be legitimate. Um, and, and what's worse is that in many, in, in the United States and in some other countries, uh, it is used not so much as a sanction, but as a, as a measure of prison administration, quote unquote, or, uh, uh, or in the form of administrative measures, which uh, astoundingly lead some US federal courts to say that in that case they don't, because it's administrative and not disciplinary, they don't need to look into whether due process has been observed. Um, solitary confinement, uh, I called for some prohibitions, and uh, uh, I'm hoping that this discussion is being carried not only in the United States, but elsewhere. Uh, first, that we should abolish indefinite uh, solitary confinement altogether, because it seems to me that it does prohibit prolonged uh, um, uh, solitary confinement. And here we have a problem with, with what should be prolonged. But at the very least, uh, and according to medical literature, psychiatric literature, uh, after 15 days, the brain starts operating differently. And in some cases, the effect can be lasting. And just as, a, at least as a, for a conversational topic, I suggested that any, any period of more than 15 days in, in solitary confinement should be prohibited. But of course, um, the most important thing is to decide on, on what the limit is. Right now, there is no limit. Uh, there are literally states that have, in their, in their laws, in their books, the ability to put uh, people in solitary confinement for months and for years at a time, uh, or in periods, but repeating the period, beginning, you know, ending three months and it's starting the next day, the next three months. So it seems to me like uh, uh, we need to have a prohibition on prolonged solitary confinement. And of course, we should have a pro prohibition on solitary confinement even for a single day of juveniles and of anybody with a mental disability. Thank you. And even, even for those cases in which short-term solitary confinement may be justified, we can imagine some cases in which it might be justified. Even for those cases, we need strict procedural safeguards, due process safeguards, so that the person submitted to it can challenge uh, the, the decision and the length of the term, but also uh, medical safeguards, so that we know uh, that people are not put in solitary confinement because they have mental disabilities, which is unfortunately what we hear more and more from the cases that, are, that come to our attention. Another area in which the survivor-centered approach has uh, uh, assisted my mandate is in recognizing that there is a whole area of torture and or cruel inhuman and degrading treatment uh, that happened in, you know, for lack of a better organizing principle, I, I call healthcare settings. For example, uh, denial of pain treatment. In most countries around the world, pain treatment is, not, is simply not part of the protocol of uh, healthcare uh, around the world. Mostly because they feel that it can be addictive. Uh, but science has shown that there are uh, you know, inexpensive and, uh, and safe uh, pain uh, control treatment that is denied to 80 or 90% of sick people around the world today. 
Also, the treatment of drug users. In many countries around the world, uh, drug users are subject not only to inhuman and degrading treatment because they are uh, stigmatized for being drug users, but also with uh, forms of treatment that amount to cruel inhuman and degrading treatment, and in some extreme cases can amount to torture as well. Uh, we included examples of discriminatory practices against LGBTI uh, patients that are also uh, stigmatized because of their uh, uh, condition as LGBTI, but also subjected to some uh, unscientific and completely unsound uh, procedures, some of them surgical, uh, that, uh, that amount, in my mind, certainly to cruel human and brain treatment or even uh, to torture. And uh, the most controversial part of this is the forced interventions on mental patients. Uh, there may be uh, uh, some cases in which uh, some forced uh, intervention may be necessary, but around the world what happening, what's happening is that states uh, claim to some notions of guardianship and uh, uh, that basically um, deny uh, the whole principle of uh, informed consent and just basically allow somebody to make uh, that informed consent on behalf of the mental patient, uh, that it would include not only isolation and, and solitary confinement, but also forced interventions, including with uh, uh, medicines, uh, without uh, the, the, the participation and the consent, the informed consent of, of the victims. Um, I, I'd like to finish just by saying that these are just some examples of how uh, maybe it was a good instinct on my part to start my uh, rapporteurship uh, with a sense that we needed to have a, a survivor-centered uh, approach. But, uh, but I was lucky enough that that instinct has allowed me to learn so much from survivors and victims uh, that I think have made uh, my, uh, my work uh, worthwhile. So that's why I am particularly grateful to TASC and to the uh, National Religious Coalition and to all the other uh, sponsors for putting me in touch uh, uh, with survivors that have been uh, not only a great source of knowledge for me, but also, quite frankly, a great source of inspiration. Thank you very much. Okay, so now it is my honor to introduce to you a panel who will be responding to the remarks of Mr. Mendez. I wish I was on that panel. I have lots of notes on this day. Um, but I will introduce them all right now and in the order of their speaking. Um, first, we will have Eileen Diaz Picasso, who is from the Philippines and is currently the Secretary General of the Asian Federation Against Involuntary Disappearances and is the focal point for the International Coalition Against Enforced Disappearances. These two coalitions, in collaboration with the Latin American Federation of Associations of Relatives of Disappeared Detainees, were instrumental in getting the General Assembly of the United Nations to adopt the UN Convention for the pro protection of all persons from enforced disappearance in December of 2006. And has that also, that decree also made enforced disappearance a crime against humanity. So Eileen will be our first respondent, followed by Adote Akwe, um, who is originally from Ghana and is the Managing Director for Governmental Relations for Amnesty International USA. Before Amnesty, um, Mr. Akwe worked for CARE USA um, as the Deputy Director for Government Relations, but before that, he also worked for Amnesty International um, for 11 years, first as the Advocacy Director for Africa, and then later as the Director of Campaigns, and has a very distinguished career of working with human rights with, with the focus on the African continent. Um, and then our last speaker will be Reverend Michael Neuroff, who is an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ and serves as the policy advocate for international issues in the UCC's Justice and Witness Ministry, Ministries Office in Washington, D.C. 
Um, he's worked very closely with various ecumenical and interfaith organizations, including the World Council of Churches, Church World Service, Ecumenical Advocacy Days, and the Parliament of World Religions. So we have a very excellent panel that will be responding, and then we will be opening it up for questions from you all. Thank also our keynote speaker, Mr. Juan Mendez, for a very good um, presentation about torture, he being himself a survivor of torture. And I would like to thank TASC for once again inviting me here um, to speak before you about torture. I would like to respond to the speaker in my capacity as um, Secretary General of the Asian Federation Against Disappearances and International Coalition Against Enforced Disappearances um, based on our work with survivors of enforced disappearances, families of the disappeared who themselves are victims of torture, and also on my integration with torture survivors who are members of TASC. So tomorrow, on the 26th of June, we will be giving an apt tribute to all victims of torture, both who survived torture and who haven't survived torture. So we are honored to have here the presence and solidarity of our keynote speaker, who is in the best position to be the UN Rapporteur on torture, because he himself was a victim of torture during Argentina's dictatorship. Why we are here, it is obvious, and for the past days we have listened to sharings and testimonies of victims and survivors of torture. Neris from El Salvador, Nora from Honduras, Hussein from Ethiopia, and many others. It is very clear that there is an existence of torture here in the U.S. and in many other parts of the world. And we are here in recognition of the very negative effects of torture being suffered by many of us here, including our speaker, and of the need for individual and collective action to combat torture and to combat impunity, and the importance of the struggle for truth, for justice, for reparation, rehabilitation, and uh, non-repetition. But unfortunately, as our speaker said, many states, even those who are states parties to the Convention Against Torture, have ignored um, many forms of healing. We're talking here of healing from torture. And based on our experience with families of the disappeared, with disappeared who reappeared and resurfaced alive, truth telling is a very important form of healing for victims and survivors to be able to tell their story. And it's important for them to be also in solidarity with co victims, co survivors, and of course, uh, the importance of therapy psychosocial support, psychosocial rehabilitation, accompaniment, and building communities of healing. Our speaker mentioned about Istanbul Protocol, which states should abide, but not all states or majority of states have um, respected this Istanbul, Istanbul Protocol, and the need to investigate torture in my country despite um, the Philippine government's ratification of the Convention on Torture and the enactment of a domestic law against torture, there are still many cases of torture even beyond the administration of President, the former President Marcos during the 21 years of his dictatorship, even under the present administration of President Benigno Aquino III. Our speaker mentioned of the existence of the UN Voluntary Fund for Victims of Torture, which our organization has benefited or is benefiting because it is giving direct medical, psychosocial, 
assistance to victims of torture, victims of enforced disappearances who suffer from who have suffered from torture. And I would like to add that what is important for victims and survivors of torture is the need to find justice, to continue the work for justice, the need for solidarity, the need for reparation because damage has been done, and non-repetition. -rep so it is important, the work of TASC is very important, the work of other organizations fighting against torture is very important. In our case, um, with organizations of families of the disappeared in Asia and in the rest of the world, we consider enforced disappearance as also very much related to torture. So disappeared who survived um, enforced disappearance and who have lived to tell their stories, tell about their stories of torture. My husband, uh, who disappeared many years ago and was released because another detainee um, another disappeared person escaped, has told about his story of torture uh, under the hands of the military intelligence group in the Philippines. And those who were found dead after days, months, weeks, and months of uh, enforced disappearance, their bodies Found, were found with marks of torture, with evidence of torture. And there's continuing pain to families who themselves, some of them themselves disappeared in the search for finding, um, in, the search, in, in the course of finding the truth, in the course of finding their disappeared loved ones. Y yesterday I gave some examples of um, disappeared, who reappeared, disappeared people who reappeared, like the Borikat brothers of Morocco. Three of them disappeared for more than 20 years and was, were able to, uh, they were released several years later because of the campaign of Amnesty International against political killings and disappearances. So their bodies, they're here in the U.S., their bodies uh, bear marks of torture. And uh, I also met Mohamed Nadrani, also from Morocco. He disappeared for eight years. He was made to extract teeth of his co-detainees. And he was surfaced, he was released alive eight years after his disappearance. And in our country, uh, we have two brothers also who disappeared and they recounted, they presented to the Supreme Court uh, how they were able to witness the rape of two university of the Philippines female students who were forced to, to confess their involvement in uh, the Communist Party of the Philippines. So with this much remains to be done, and I agree with uh, what our speaker mentioned about the importance of the multidisciplinary approach to torture because of distinct and varying effects of torture on each victim and in recognition also of the multi-layered effects of torture and the need for states to work with survivors and not on survivors, the need for participation. He stressed the importance of participation because they are in the best position to tell what is best for them. And we also in our organization agree against death, about no to death penalty and no to solitary confinement. And in our experience with uh, victims, families of victims of disappearances, they suffer deteriorating health, also deteriorating mental health, hence healthcare is very important. So what should we do? There are many things that, that remain to be done. The conduct of different forms of healing and the work of task is really very important and we hope that this could be replicated in other countries. The information dissemination for uh, on, on cases of torture and 
situations of torture in different countries because not many people know about this. The need to build capacities among survivors of torture and of course the continuing campaign for ratification of the Convention on Torture in many countries and the enactment of laws against torture and most importantly their implementation. And we're talking here of destroying the culture of torture. So I would like to reiterate, to repeat what Fatima um, Cabrera Rice mentioned yesterday, that it is important to build a human rights culture, a culture of human rights. Therefore, I would like finally to call for solidarity and unity among us in order to promote and defend life, no to torture. Thank you very much. Organizers for um, uh, putting this event together and for uh, inviting me. This is a special honor to be with uh, uh, Professor Mendez again, who is uh, uh, an, an inspiration. I'd also like to thank each of you for coming out because <clears throat> it is, um, it, it's, it's just very actually inspiring to see so many of us here uh, because uh, we are in very difficult and dark times. And unfortunately, um, it is easy to think that we are not only alone, but that we are doomed to failure, but we're not. Um, I come from an organization that I think many of you are familiar with, um, and my response to uh, Dr. Mendez's comments are going to be about the kind of work that Amnesty International does, um, which is basically education, awareness raising, campaigning, and political impact. Um, because the imposition or the, 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 the violation of torture, um, while not limited to government authorities, sadly is happening too often because of government authorities. And not just any government, but our own government. Um, we are in a period where the global paradigm shaped out of Washington um, and that is being delivered to the American people is that torture is fine as long as it keeps us safe. And if it's done against the right people, then it's even better. And if it has impact, then of course it works. And how can we argue with that? Um, the same messaging is being delivered to other governments. And I think, as was said earlier, my focus is primarily on Sub-Saharan Africa, where um, the approach to um, extracting what is called necessary information in the war on terror actually is encouraged by Washington and rewarded um, from its political allies. Um, we are going to be seeing President Obama go to Africa tomorrow, starting tomorrow morning. He's going to be going for three days to, uh, uh, and the focus of the trip is to talk about promoting trade and investment, which is fine and good. Africa certainly needs them. But there's not going to be any discussions about justice and about accountability and about the government's obligations not to engage in torture. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, and uh, we, it seems to me that we have to not only work together and to unite, but we also, I think, have to come up with some new ideas and some new tactics because the, we, we can't rely, we, we don't seem to have, to have the necessary tools or the arguments or the, certainly we don't have the resources to, to, to counteract this message that torture is fine because it's being done for the right reasons and of course with the right, with the right control and by the right people. Um, we, 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 we have to remind people about the moral incorrectness, the legal incorrectness of torture and the inhumanity of torture and to make it as unacceptable and as abhorrent as it should be. And that's what this room represents to me, that there are people who are still engaged in this struggle to, to, to counteract this message, to work with
with survivors, as was said, not for survivors, or um, and also to to um, push what is supposedly a friendly administration to change policies and to be the leader that it was meant to be, or that we hoped it would be when it came into power in 2008. Our work um, around torture, of course, with uh, a lot of people here and a lot of organizations, focuses on um, closing Guantanamo, which is the, it, it is not the only core focal point, unfortunately, of bad behavior, but it, it is certainly the, the central point and the one that's most visible and the one that undermines everything because not only is the U.S. keeping people in detention there, it is um, also a, a, a violation of the U.S.'s obligations uh, under international treaties, and it's the one that has been, and we've been unable to have an acceptable resolution to even with a president that has recommitted himself over and over again to doing it. Um, and in addition to Guantanamo, obviously, we have to work on uh, trying to stop the um, practices and policies in the uh, National Defense Authorization Act and it's really, um, uh, that, that are always laden with the worst kinds of provisions that allow questionable behavior. Um, we have our work on the, the, plan, the, the programs of renditions and the this assistance going to foreign governments that do the work that the United States doesn't want to be directly linked to. Um, but in addition to Guantanamo, we are also working on, um, as Amnesty has done since it started in the 1960s, individualizing torture, making the American public that is either unaware or indifferent to the, to the costs and consequences of torture and making it real. Um, one of the cases, Shakar Amar, is, is a, a, an individual case that many of you have worked on. And we had, just last week, um, I think a major step forward in that we had the British Prime Minister ask President Obama in a G8 meeting, what is going on? Why is this man still in jail? Um, it may not seem like much because Mr. Amar is still in jail, but at least wherever the president goes, he should be forced to answer questions and <laughs> We are, um, we're going to, I think, um, have to regird ourselves because uh, I, I, I remember listening to a quote of um, the president of the NAACP, Ben Jealous, when uh, President Obama was first elected, and they were talking about what their relationship would be, and Mr. Jealous said that he was going to be his favorite Douglas to his Abraham Lincoln. And I thought that was actually a very interesting and appropriate analogy. We must make this president listen to his better angels and do the right thing. Um, and that, I think, is what our gathering here together really should be leading us towards. Um, it is not only to recognize and heal and unify, but also to recommit ourselves to making the U.S. government change policy. And that means that we need to make the American people demand a change in policy, because our leaders will only answer to their constituents. Um, as, we, as we come together um, over the next couple of, uh, certainly, unfortunately, we're taking more than this president's of term in office, um, we have got to remember that there are no exceptions. The prohibition on torture is, is, is firm, it's clear, it's there for a reason. Um, that investigations and accountability and redress, those have been mentioned, as well as safeguards, all of those things need to be consistently raised with our members of Congress, as well as with our executive branch members. Um, and finally, we must also remember to be with each other in, in a humane and human, human, humanizing way. Um, the, there, one of the, um, the interesting cases that I have just been learning about, um, which Dr. Mendes mentioned, was the issue of solitary confinement. I don't know how many of you know about the case of the Angola Three, who are um, in Louisiana and have been incarcerated despite having convictions overturned by local courts um, several times have been 
in jail for close to 30 years. Um, one of them, Robert King, was released about 15 years ago and has been trying desperately to try and get his two colleagues out for a crime that they did not commit. Despite the overturning of their convictions by the lower courts, the Louisiana Attorney General has, is on the record of saying that these men will not be released alive while he is Attorney General. Um, we've just unfortunately got some very sad news that one of them has just been diagnosed with lung cancer and has a prognosis of anywhere from two months to a year. And that even if um, compassionate release um, was expedited by the governor, Governor Jindal, um, the, the Louisiana system is not going to move fast enough. I, I, I can't, I, I find this outrageous, and I think that whether Albert has two months or two years, his case and Herman's case and Robert's case have to be fought for and won because the principle is right and it must not happen to anybody else ever again. You can't have solitary confinement the way it's being done in the United States, as Dr. Mendez mentioned. Um, among some of the things that are being done to them, of course, they're being kept in uh, rooms that are six by 12. Um, they are strip search, search every time they leave the room, even to go to the bathroom, despite not having anything in the room except the bed. The, the, there's nothing else to be here except torture, the way these men are being treated. And we can't have that in this country. And I, I, I certainly call on all of you to, to sort of regurge yourselves and let us work together and let us end torture um, and let us change the policies of the Obama administration together. Thank you. Someone else who took a very victim-centered approach in his ministry here in uh, many years ago, and that is Jesus. Uh, as speaking as a person of faith, uh, that is why I'm here today. Uh, I recently also saw that NERCAT called for uh, encouraging the Obama administration to issue an invitation for you to come and investigate solitary confinement here in the U.S. I think that that needs to happen. There's a growing moral consensus against solitary confinement and how it points to the broader unjust and racist prison system here in the U.S. I want to give thanks to NERCAT for calling attention to the culture of torture that exists here in our society today. As people of faith, we often ask the question, is it well with our soul? And I think it's clear that today things are not well with our soul. Not well with our soul individually, not well with our collective soul as a nation. At a point when there's 80,000, as Linda mentioned, 80,000 people any given day in solitary confinement. And we know what that means. As Leonard Peltier a famous uh, uh, prisoner once said, uh, we do not do time, time does us. The cannibalistic nature of solitary confinement should challenge uh, everyone. Guantanamo, that it continues to exist as a symbol of torture, as a moral stain in our world today. I think it's vital that the National Religious Campaign Against Torture remains a religious campaign. That there are civil, legal, and human, human rights perspectives to bring to the issue of torture. But there are particularly moral and religious convictions that torture is against the will of God. This is based not only in our scriptures that lift up ministries of religious figures like Jesus who had a victim-centered approach, but also we see it fundamentally in God's nature in our traditions. We have a crucified God, as Jürgen Moltmann so uh, powerfully described. We have an executed God. We have a tortured God. The 
that God calls us and exposes our humanity and the need to stand against the theatrics of terror and imperialism in our world. As a faith community, we can uniquely speak to these issues, and in our best, we can inspire people to move. We can inspire people to pray with their feet, to build and sustain movements for justice. And I believe that is what NERCAT does today. I want to give thanks to NERCAT for the many staff that have put this event together, for calling us to think about what it means to live in a culture of torture. For NERCAT's work calling faith communities to respond, for linking us to experts such as Juan and the partner organizations such as TASC, Amnesty, and the various organizations represented here tonight, and for lifting up a uniquely faith voice on these issues that threaten our communities and indeed threaten the moral fabric, fabric of our society. So thank you all for coming. I think we're moving on to questions. of the 100 plus prisoners amount to Center. Uh, the owners of the Jeff Rodenberg Center, by the way, this is a 
private institution, but it uses uh, public funds because states uh, actually finance the, uh, 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 the internment uh, of uh, autistic children there. Um, the Judge Rodenberg Center has invited me to visit, but because I have to uh, go through official channels, I'm asking the State Department to, to tell me if they have any objection to my visit. Uh, and I have sent a communication, and the government, uh, the, the federal government, has answered uh, that the Justice Department has a study going on that, unfortunately, is not completed yet uh, about discriminatory practices. Uh, uh, discriminatory on the basis of, uh, uh, of uh, mental illness uh, against some of these people. Um, I, I'm still, uh, you know, I, I, I have already condemned the use of electroshock under all circumstances. Um, but uh, it seems to me like the problem goes beyond that and uh, it, it, uh, uh, discriminatory practices are not going to be enough. I mean, uh, because then uh, the Judge Rodenberg Center can say that it applies it uh, uh, to some people but not to others, and so it's not discriminatory. Um, so we are we're working on it, and uh, many groups in the United States are, are working on it as well. And uh, this is an example that also links to the previous question. Uh, my mandate deals only with state agents, but we recognize that sometimes uh, torture or cruelly human and degrading treatment can be inflicted by non-state agents under certain circumstances. For example, domestic violence. We, we have to look for a connection with the state, either because the state knows or should have or ought to have known uh, that um, torture or cruelly human and degrading treatment happens even between private parties. Uh, if we find that connection, the knowledge or ought to have known connection, then we can act against states as well. And this, of course, you know, is a big issue with organized crime, especially in the north of Mexico, where it commits all kinds of atrocities. And you know, putting the blame on the government of Mexico uh, demands proving chapter and verse of some kind of complicity by some state agents with organized crime. And unfortunately, um, it's not un unheard of, unfortunately, in Mexico. So in those cases, like in cases of domestic violence, we can act under certain circumstances, uh, even if the direct perpetrator is not a state agent like the judge Robert Brooks. I'm Dorothy Day, Catholic worker and uh, torture victim present with us not too far away is Bradley Manning, so I'd, I'd like us to remember him and maybe go to his trial. Uh, it's very nearby. Uh, but uh, my question is uh, two, I just have two very short questions for uh, uh, Dr. Mendez. One is uh, the current Pope, Pope Francis, uh, a citizen of uh, Argentina, um, and um, in 1977 I think he was provincial of the Jesuit community. I wondered, do you know him or have you asked to visit him and encourage him to get involved in trying to stop the United States from torturing people, all the other countries. So that's one question. And the other question is, uh, remembering what Alexander Haig said, uh, that let the people demonstrate all they want as long as they pay taxes. <laughs> I'm asking you whether or not, given all of the atrocities we've heard about tonight, ongoing atrocities, equivalent to me, I feel like I'm living in Hitler's Germany, uh, is it illegal, I, mean, I know it's immoral, is it illegal to pay taxes to the federal government of the United States that is torturing so many people throughout the world? David Krantz, Nonviolent Peace Force. I want to go a little deeper into that question about uh, forced feeding. The uh, World Medical Association is called forced feeding a, uh, a crime. But the American Medical Association has not made a statement and is not bound by the World Organization. And is it not so that the countries, states, have a requirement to protect their prisoners? So I wanted to ask Mr. Mendez about if the prisoner gets to the point of being unable to, to 
function in, in out of middle state, then do you support or not the injection, I presume, of, of uh, food, or do you want the person to die? It's a question I've got rolling around in my head. Thank you. I'm Scott Wilson, um, unaffiliated. I've been concerned for some time about whether or not what goes on in Gitmo constitutes war crime. That's it. You're right. But uh, first, uh, I know I don't know Pope Francis. I know of him. Of course, he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires until he was named Pope. He was the Jesuit provincial during the dictatorship. Um, there is some controversy about whether he did enough to protect, including Jesuit priests, from torture and disappearance. Uh, I think the questions are well known. Uh, I think the question is more or less settled. And uh, you either think uh, he, he could have done more, or you think like him that he did what he could. And I, I'm, not, I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, among other things, because one of the victims of the incident in which he saved two Jesuit priests after five months of disappearance, but he didn't save the lay, lay persons. One of those lay persons was the 24-year-old daughter of a very good friend and mentor, Emilio Mignone. Uh, and Emilio Mignone died uh, harshly criticizing Pope uh, Bergoglio uh, for not having done enough to, to save uh, these Catholic lay workers that were working with the two Jesuit priests. On the other hand, uh, a lot of uh, his first few days in the uh, papacy had been had been really enlightened. Very, I think he's very sincere about his uh, uh, siding with the poor. Um, uh, I think he, he will probably change the, the attitudes of the Vatican. Uh, even today, apparently, or yesterday, he refused to appear uh, in some big uh, event, apparently suggesting a life of luxury in the Vatican. All of those things are very good. And I know that some very well, very highly respected human rights leaders uh, in Argentina, like Alofo Perez Equivet, who is a Nobel Peace Prize winner, uh, uh, supports uh, Pope Francis and is hoping for the best from the papacy. Let me leave it at that, because I don't know that much more about him anyway. Um, uh, I can't comment on whether uh, it, would, it would be uh, illegal to pay taxes uh, uh, to the United States government or to any government. Uh, I, th I think the law doesn't go as far as to say that you are obliged not to pay taxes. I think the law protects you from not paying tax taxes if you uh, decide on, as a matter of a moral choice not to pay taxes. Uh, but whether you're obliged not to pay taxes, I think that's a question that the law does not have an answer for, either international or domestic law for that matter. Uh, about the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, of course it was a, a, a wonderful experience uh, in uh, settling accounts with the murderous regime. Uh, I also think that uh, now that almost 20 years have gone by, we all uh, know that the experience had some limitations and some important limitations of that. One, the insistence on uh, truth as automatically follow, uh, leading to reconciliation has not panned out, I don't think. And two, the lack of insistence on criminal accountability of the perpetrators. I think. Most other societies that went through uh, transitional moments like uh, South Africa uh, have chosen not to follow that model. Um, among other things because it's unsatisfactory and it's, uh, it's also under international law clear that for some crimes like torture, the obligation to investigate, prosecute and punish cannot be satisfied with truth telling alone. Uh, nevertheless, I think the Truth and Reconciliation Commission did a wonderful job it was the first to hold public hearings. It was the first to uh, engage victims uh, of apartheid in a very hum human and personal way. And for that reason, uh, it stands as, a, as an important model for truth-telling. Again, an important model for truth-telling, not necessarily the ultimate model for accountability. Uh, 
with respect to force feeding, um, as the as as you pointed out, the World Medical Association uh, is on record criticizing force feeding. Uh, I know that many other national medical associations uh, either have not taken a position or uh, or have taken a position in favor of force feeding. Uh, but I rely not only on the, on the World Medical Association, but also on doctors who work with prisoners all the time. And the, the International Committee of the Red Cross and the physicians for the International Committee of the Red Cross uh, have made very, very profound studies on this, and they come very uh, strongly against force feeding. Uh, but your question is well taken. Uh, if force feeding is wrong, because it's an invasion of the autonomy and the, the capacity of decision making of the inter who decides not to eat, uh, then it follows that if uh, the intern is not in a capacity to reason by him or herself, then force feeding uh, may be necessary to save the life uh, uh, of the inmate. Uh, the problem is that in, in many places, and particularly in Guantanamo, uh, force feeding is done from the start even before there's any, even any kind of uh, sh uh, showing of serious uh, physical uh, effects of the, of, of the hunger strike. And if you read uh, the methods that are applied on force feeding um, and that have been revealed you know, in documents, actually uh, official technical documents about how to uh, do force feeding, I think you would agree with me that uh, these things are painful, they are, they are even brutal, and uh, therefore, in my mind, they do uh, cross the line into truly human and degrading treatment. Um, and finally, the torture is a war crime. Yeah, in, in, in a conflict setting, it's a war crime. No, no question about it. The Geneva Convention says very clearly, in Common Article 3, that any outrage of the personal dignity of a, of a prisoner and that includes not only torture, but also cruel, human and degrading treatment, is a war crime. Now, it's not a war crime all the time. It's not a war crime if it's not in the context of, of, of an armed conflict. It's a war crime when it is part of war. When it's not part of war, it, uh, it may be a crime against humanity if it's, uh, if it's a deliberate or system, widespread or systematic, or it's just is uh, an important uh, serious human rights violation, even when it is an isolated case. We're very deeply honored and also it's a great joy tonight to recognize uh, two of our speakers, Juan Mendez and Eileen Bacalso. And there's a very, um, very close connection of each of these persons to Patrick Rice, in whose name this award will be given. Uh, and we will soon call upon um, Patrick's widow, Fatima Cabrera, uh, to make this award. But I'd like to say just um, a few brief words. I think what unites our diverse communities tonight, um, many of us are people of faith, Many of us are passionate defenders of human rights. Many of us are survivors of torture. And I, I know that many of us here tonight uh, knew Patrick. He came on many occasions here to Washington, D.C., um, spoke during Torture Awareness Month in June, June Survivor Week. Uh, he was a member of TASC as uh, is his widow, Fatima Cabrera. But he was also very um, closely bound to the two persons who were receiving this award tonight. Um, Patrick was a survivor of torture in Argentina and was in prison at the same time as Juan Mendez. And Patrick, over many years, um, was Secretary General of the Association of Family Members of the Disappeared in Latin America. He helped the Asian Federation Against Involuntary Disappearances begin, and together with family members around the world, was instrumental in getting the United Nations to pass 
the Convention Against Enforced Disappearances. So there's no other person better who could do this than uh, his dear wife, Fatima Cabrera, who equally is a survivor of torture. Patrick and Fatima were tortured together. Um, later they became husband and wife, parents of three children, very active in the human rights organization EHOS in Argentina. Uh, Fatima like Patrick is a, a deep person of faith, passionate and ardent defender of human rights. Uh, and I'd like to call upon her tonight to make this award, to offer some words uh, about Patrick. Um, and she will be uh, assisted by Maria Luisa Rosal as an interpreter, who is also the daughter of a disappeared father in Guatemala in 1983. So if I could call forward Fatima Maria Luisa. Y a todos los compañeros sobrevivientes de tortura, a Juan Méndez, amigo de Patricia que compartió parte de su camino, a Eileen, que también ha sido una defensora incansable por las víctimas y fundamentalmente llevar esta reflexión eh, para destacar la coherencia de vida de Patricia. Eh, Patricio fue un sacerdote que llegó a Argentina y América Latina eh, desde Irlanda. So, good evening. Uh, I thank all of you for the international campaign, uh, friends, survivors, all the organizations here present this evening, to Juan, um, and friends of uh, Patricio, and also thank you, Ali, um, your work in the support of human rights and accompaniment of uh, family members is so important. Eh, Patricio siempre eh, entendió que, que su elección de, de vida en la fe eh, era para entregarse hacia los más pobres. Y cuando llegó a Argentina se encontró que a él fue a, eh, a una universidad donde era una población muy rica porque era ganadera. Y allí empezó a cuestionarse diciendo yo no vine a este lugar en el del mundo para tener privilegios. So, eh, Patricio, he always understood that his faith was the path to work for and in favor of the poor. Uh, when he came to Argentina, uh, the university, he was um, to work in an area where there was um, a cattle ranching community and he realized that he wasn't supposed to be there just to work in favor of the, uh, the wealthy. He buscó una comunidad más comprometida de sacerdotes obreros que vivió, eh, vivía con los sancheros y desde allí comenzó a trabajar en comunidades eh, muy pobres, eh, conviviendo con, con, con los más pobres, hasta que llegó la dictadura. So, he went in search of a community of uh, religious workers uh, to work in the communities, to live in the communities, on behalf of the communities. Um, and he did this work until uh, the time of the dictatorship. Fuimos secuestrados en octubre del año 1976, eh, pasando por los más terribles tormentos eh, y un lugar de, de terror y muerte. Los militares se sentían dueños de nuestra vida y allí Patricio siempre decía que él entendió que Dios estaba con las víctimas y no con ellos, que también decían defender un mundo occidental cristiano. In October of 1976, uh, we were kidnapped and we went through uh, a terrible phase of torment, terror, of death, uh, where the military believed themselves to be the uh, in, in charge and owners of our own lives. And Patricio always said that God was with the victims. Um, and the military, uh, at this time also said to be, uh, said that God was in their favor, on their side. 
Junto a Patricio, yo también fui catequista y siempre creí en una iglesia del pueblo. En Argentina eh, fue muy reprimida, distintas iglesias. Hay un estado de más de 200 víctimas de, entre laicos y religiosos de diferentes, eh, diferentes religiones. So with Patricio, I was a catechist, um, and I also, I too believed in a church uh, of the poor. And um, as a result of the repression, over 200 religious workers uh, were victims of the dictatorship. Un poco antes de, de morir, Patricio había comenzado y denunciado de una capilla que fue hecha en la dictadura en la Escuela Mecánica de la Armada, donde hubo 5.000 detenidos desaparecidos y además nacieron 65 niños en cautiverio. Hoy fue pedido de las madres de Plaza de Mayo y familiares, ese espacio interreligioso tiene el nombre de Patricio Reyes y hay un gran cartel en la puerta que donde denuncia lo que hicieron los capellanes de las Fuerzas Armadas y eh, comienza a tener eh, distintas actividades, entre ellas hace tres años que hacemos un vía crucis ecuménico por las víctimas. That chapel where he denounced these uh, atrocities um, uh, take, uh, has the name of Patrick Rice. Uh, and it's a place now where there are various human rights activities, uh, various human rights organizations. It's been taken back as a space for memory. Uh, just one example, there was a... Uh, um, way of the cross. The way of the cross, <laughs> um, Las víctimas de, de tortura y quienes fuimos testigos de, de la muerte, del exterminio de miles de, de, de compañeros y compañeras y de una generación muy joven en toda América Latina, somos conscientes de que fue un plan sistemático de seguridad nacional implementado desde los Estados Unidos. As victims, we were witness to this uh, process of extermination. We were a young generation then, and we know that this was done also at the behest of the United States. Creemos firmemente que tenemos que luchar eh, muy fuerte y exigiendo en los distintos ámbitos de la sociedad, además de los de nuestra fe, especialmente en educación, en, en todo lo que implique la salud, en la ampliación de derechos, en poder tener democracias activas y participativas que defiendan la vida y los derechos. We believe um, uh, that, that this struggle needs to continue not just uh, uh, in the religious uh, communities, but in every corner of society, in education, um, uh, in, in uh, health, in, um, in defense of human rights. Estos días falleció eh, el domingo Laura Bonaparte, una gran amiga nuestra eh, que vino muchas veces también a denunciar aquí y entre el mensaje que ella daba decía si bien nunca dejaré de ser víctima del genocidio si bien mi duelo se apagará conmigo, nunca lograron encerrarme en ese espacio donde la muerte ronda la derrota. On Sunday, this past Sunday, a great friend, Laura Bonaparte, passed away. She was a, a mother of the mothers of the Pastamay, uh, abuela Sar. And she always had this message uh, that, that, read, that reads, Well, I will never stop being a victim of genocide, 
And I, although my pain um, and my grief will die with me when I pass, they will never succeed at shutting me away in that place where death is surrounded by defeat. En Argentina hoy somos un ejemplo en el mundo de tener 2.500 procesos abiertos y más de 250 represores que estuvieron en juicios y muchos tienen cadena perpetua. Muchos de ellos se llevaron la información que necesitamos para llegar a la verdad a su tumba. Tienen un pacto de silencio donde no dicen una palabra. Sin embargo, las víctimas, que son miles de víctimas, jamás tuvimos ningún espíritu de venganza y al contrario, ellos son respetados en todos sus derechos, lo que demuestra que debemos partir de otra cultura, de una cultura de respeto a los derechos humanos, de la paz, de poder superar y, y enfrentar nuestros conflictos desde una política de no discriminación y de diálogo. In Argentina, um, we, we've become an example for the world. Uh, today, there have been over, there are uh, 2,500 cases uh, being brought to, to, to justice. Um, over about 250 convictions already, uh, many of them with uh, life sentences. Many of uh, those perpetrators uh, have carried the information with them. They've, they've uh, carried a, a pact of silence. And uh, the victims, us victims, and there are thousands of us, uh, we've carried out these, these processes without a spirit of vengeance. Uh, we work based on an ethic of, of human rights, of no discrimination, and uh, this is, this is our, our ethic. Para mí es un honor y un gran gusto entregar hoy este premio y este reconocimiento entre mis compañeros sobrevivientes a Aileen y a Juan Méndez y agradecer a, a todos ustedes y a TAS poder entregar esto en comunidad. Finalmente, Laura Bonaparte, madre de Plaza de Mayo, también decía Defender los derechos humanos es acceder a la posibilidad de compartir con otros seres humanos la generosidad que está dentro de cada uno. Gracias. So for me it's an honor to give this award to Aileen and to Juan Mendes. And I want to thank you all for your presence and to share this event and this moment and also to task uh, to do this together in a community. Uh, I want to also um, say something else that Laura Bonaparte would also say. And defending human rights is to open up to the possibility of sharing with other human beings the generosity that lies within each of us. Thank you. Patricio, but his death 
will not be in vain. We believe that um, death is not putting out the light, but it's not extinguishing the light, but putting out the lamp because the dawn has come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 